Hi, and welcome to the Environment TV. I'm Charlie Olson, your host, talking to you about Staten Island environmental communities' concerns, which you, I, and we are all part of. And so are my co-reporters and co-hosts here. Let me introduce you, first of all, to Kathleen Harris. Uh, she's an assistant producer and a, a reporter for a number of stories that are upcoming. And two other reporters uh, and guests are on my left here, on my right, excuse me, my right, Jack Bolenbach from the Pro uh, Protectors of Pine Oak Woods here in Staten Island, and uh, Mark Latour, also from the Protectors. We short name and call them the Protectors. We want to hear from you. A lot of our show really is based on your concerns, and we want to hear what you have to say. So use the link that you see below or at the end of the show and contact us and let us know what you're thinking either locally or worldwide on the environment. Today we have a few topics for you, but first of all, a few scientific facts. We are now entering our closest distance to the sun, which will occur on December 21st when we will be 91 million miles close to old Sol. Yet, uh, for this part of the planet, especially Staten Island, we are in the winter. This is not the summer as it would be in Australia. And we call that day uh, the winter solace. It is also the shortest daylight day of the year. Not the shortest day, but the shortest daylight day. And as we uh, uh, shoot this episode, our satellite, the moon, is in its waxing phase, which means it's growing lighter and lighter. We see more of it. It goes from a quarter moon to a half moon to a three quarters moon and hits its brightest full moon on about November the 8th. As usual, here on Staten Island, and Staten Island is an island totally surrounded by water, which many of us may forget, there are two high and two low tides. Uh, and uh, the high tides are occurring at 12-hour intervals approximately, one at 4.30 in the morning and then occurring again at 4.30 in the afternoon. And in the middle of that comes the low tides, which is about 10 o'clock in the morning and then occurring again at about 11 o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening, <laughs> way in the nighttime, actually. Our first story will talk of some of the enjoyments of Staten Island's natural community which is composed of 475,000 residents. Kathleen Harris will give that report. Kathleen, what do you have for us at this time? Okay, well, we're going to be talking about an unbelievable place called St. Francis Woodlands. Do you like wa walking on nature trails? You really don't like stumbling on rocks, looking out for the tree roots, or getting your shoes dirty? Well, on here on Staten Island, off of Toad Hill Road, at the very end of Helena Street is a uh, wonderful place called the St. Francis Woodlands. It's a wonderful place that you can go to look at the forest. And in, during the pandemic, the St. Francis Woodlands was improved and got an elevated boardwalk. Uh, prior to that, they had the red, red and green trails and now they have, starting at the forest floor of the parking lot, is an elevated boardwalk that goes up very at a very slight pace and then continues up into, up into the forest and brings you up to a wonderful way to look at the trees and see areas of the trees that you really don't get to see very often. Usually we're, you're walking around on the floor and you know, you're looking up at the trees and you don't get to see very close up to the bark or even some of the branches. And you just, you know, it's nice, but it's just so much wonderful with this elevated <laughs> platform. Uh, as you c continue up the, the walkway, you just zig and zag all the way through and have little walkways that you can just step off or you can just continue on and get really close to the trees. We were able to see so many that it was just amazing. 
the, and now in the fall, we're able to see the leaves go from green to a fiery yellow and to uh, almost a crimson orange, like a, like a sienna, not yet red. I'm hoping to see some, some red uh, leaves in a little while. And I really enjoyed crunching the leaves. Just walking on that boardwalk was just, usually boardwalks are, are by the water, but this boardwalk, crunching those leaves and hearing the, the wind go through those leaves and it, additional leaves falling down and seeing the, these just an amazing, a, a tremendous assortment of leaves. I don't know most of what the leaves are. I, I don't know what the trees are, but just, I felt, we felt like we were so far away. And so we weren't in Staten Island anymore. That's how we felt, that we didn't hear any more car noise. We didn't hear any more um, horns. We didn't see houses. We didn't, we didn't see anything. And we saw one tree we did see up close was an American chestnut. And that was quite nice, probably the hybrid of, of an American chestnut. Though, hopefully, yes, it was. And we even saw a tree that looked like it was dead. And it didn't really, yeah. And then we saw yellow and, and orange and, and leaves coming out of a dead tree, um, which I haven't seen before, uh, you know, really. And as we, you, we kept on going up and higher up on that boardwalk, we then get to the end, at the top, a crushed gravel pathway around the Priory Pond. And the great thing about Priory Pond was there were informative signs at the base of a number of trees. There were um, tulip poplars, uh, which are extremely uh, high trees, uh, usually uh, high trees. Now, I've never seen the uh, tulip. They claim that there's, I know there's tulip leaves. The leaves of a tulip poplar are uh, shaped like a tulip, but I've been told that the, they actually produce a tulip-like flower. Um, the one, another nice tree that we saw was a northern red oak. And thankfully for those signs, because I would have never known what I was looking at, and it would tell you what, how the tree is, uh, how it grows, what the Lenapes or Native Americans used to use the trees for. And uh, so I really enjoyed walking around this. I absolutely loved black cherry. The black cherry bark was so interesting. I, I must have spent several minutes just looking at the, the black cherry tree. And uh, the the eastern white pines, which was so nice, the um, and and the smell of them was just amazing. Uh, we we were actually grabbing uh, and we actually got pine cone, <laughs> an actual pine cone, and uh, yeah yeah a, and there was other trees, Coffee. which I'm hoping is going to come up, which is the sassafras. And the sassafras is the original, yeah, there was the original, I'm not even, I don't even want to tell anybody what originally the sassafras was, but the sassafras what is um, here. What do you smell from the sassafras leaf? What does that smell like, Jack? It smells nice. Yeah, <laughs> like you want to really drink a glass of, of tea. root beer. Root beer. Yeah. And <clears throat> it was just, I highly recommend everybody to go there, uh, park in the parking lot at the end of Helena Street, and that's just off of Toad Hill Road here on Staten Island, and just get away for a few minutes, you feel like you're miles away, and you're right here on Staten Island. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, 
I really liked that. We both were at this place, St. Francis Woods, and we both enjoyed it. And she went back and took more pictures. I did some video. Uh, but she explained it quite well, and it's the emotions that come out when you're there. You're so relaxed and refreshed, and that, that is just wonderful. Uh, meditative walking, you might say. For our next report, um, we want to talk a little bit about an environmental proposal that's on our election ballot uh, that's uh, for November 8th. And if you're doing early uh, voting, um, it's out there right now. And it's for the entire state. Uh, this is going to affect all of us. It's approximately $4.2 billion. This is unbelievable. I, I, I couldn't believe that they actually wrote this kind of bill, but they did. And it's up to us to vote yes or no or not vote on it at all. That's up to you. So we're going to try and give you just a little bit of knowledge on it. Um, it's actually called, it's got a long name. It's called the Clean Water Clean Air and Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act. That is quite a mouthful. Uh, but the short name is Proposal Number 1. And in New York City, there are four proposals. So you, you read them in the Staten Island Advance or some of these other places, and you learn more about it. We'll also have a uh, link that you can uh, look at uh, and look up or Google yourself and uh, read the entire uh, act and see if you like it. And for those who aren't going to spend the time reading it, let me just give you an idea of what's in there. It's got a number of categories. And the first category uh, is the restoration and flood risk reduction. They're putting 1.1 billion, not million, but 1.1 billion dollars into that. And uh, here in Staten Island, we know about uh, <laughs> Hurricane Sandy, uh, the, the wetlands being destroyed, um, and we know that we want to uh, save them because they save us from massive flooding uh, or backup and flooding that comes from the sewer systems and the mix up of the sewer and the clean water that does happen at rainwater that does happen at certain places. So that's one part of it that would happen from this bill. Another part, $650 million, is put into the open spaces, preserving them, holding on to them. Um, and a little bit later, we have two people here who are going to talk about preserving and holding on to. Uh, green spaces, open spaces on Staten Island are borough of parks. That's what they call us here. Uh, another area uh, of money is going to be spent on climate change mitigation. That's another big amount of money, $1.5 billion. That's an incredible amount of money. And a fourth area will be on water quality, $650 million being spent on that. And that's all over the state. Uh, New York State, um, and that's going to cover many aspects of how you make sure you have good, how we have good quality water throughout. And the last uh, section that I'll talk about or just mention, and I'm only touching on these, not going in depth on these, is about environmental justice. Um, and uh, that should be Help, it's mandated in, the, uh, in, in actual words to help uh, the environmental justice areas, which are any poor areas in Staten Island that we've been putting um, uh, different kinds of waste uh, uh, buildings and other kinds of buildings we, we, uh, and taking away from them, actually. So 35 to 40 percent of the money is going to be devoted to these environmental justice areas. We're also going to be, uh, the estimates on the amount of job creations here is going to be somewhere between 84,000 and 100,000 new local sustainable jobs. And this is all uh, going to be built on bonds. This is not going to be property tax. This is not going to be a direct tax. This is going to be the selling of bonds over about a year and a half and then the paying off of those bonds over a 20-year period. Uh, one of our people here, uh, Mark Latour has written a beautiful thing in the, uh, on this proposal, and it's also on the website, of the protectors of pine oaks uh, here in Staten Island. This is their um, newsletter, their uh, October-November newsletter, I think it was, or September-October, uh, in time for 
this proposal. He wrote a report on that, and it's also in the website, the full report. I'd like to read just a little bit about it, if, if I don't make you turn red there and embarrass you too much, and if I can say it the way he was thinking of it. All neighborhoods in Staten Island are eligible for these funds from the bond initiative. While Staten, over, Staten Island overall is a highly advantaged community, all the parts have few parts that are considered disadvantaged, especially in the northern portions of Staten Island. Neighborhoods such as Graniteville, Mariner's <coughs> Harbor, Elm Park, Port Richmond, St. George, Tompkinsville, Stapleton, Clifton, Rosebank, Fort Wadsworth, Concord, Grasmere, as well as parts of Oakwood and Midland Beach are especially well positioned to receive funds for land conservation, wetlands protection, storm surge mitigation, new street trees, urban forest programs, coastal and shoreland restoration, flooding risk reductions, river and creek buffer zones, storm water runoff reduction, algae bloom remediation, and water pollution reduction projects. That's a heck of a lot. That's why it costs so much. That's a heck of a lot of environmental uh, things that we need. Thank you, Mark, for writing that up. And the whole uh, report is, uh, is at the website, and it's really worth listening to. Um, and that's the end of my report there. I, I hope you get out and take a look. Uh, and vote. That's the most important thing. Get out there and vote. Whether you want this money to be allocated that way, uh, that's up to you. And we don't know if uh, it will be uh, if it will be passed. And there's always those problems with the bills. Will the money actually be spent there? Will it be followed through? Will it be done in a good way? Well, that's something we have to follow up on, and that's what we hope to do over the next few months and year as this actually, uh, if, if this does get passed. So for our next report, I'd like to introduce Jack Bolenbach and Mark Latour, and they are going to talk about uh, their work on the Land Use Committee that they've been doing for about anywhere from three to four years, would you say? Yeah, three years. Three years. Um, and I'm part of that committee, too, so I have to let you know that. I, I've just joined them in the last few months to be a videographer for them. All right, I'll let uh, you guys take over. All right, the Environmental Bond Act that Charlie just talked about is very important because this land use committee, actually the origins of it was based on destruction of two huge acreage of land, the Graniteville Wetlands Forest, which was 18 acres. All the trees were cut down. It's an environmental justice community. It's located near the Gothels Bridge. The other community was Fort Wadsworth. Uh, it was Mount Manresa. 15 acres of old growth trees, some 400 years old, were cut down by the Salvo brothers. That was a under the table deal, a secret deal. So with the loss of, of that many acres just recently, protectors realized we have to go out there and discover what are the sites on Staten Island are unprotected. What natural areas can we do something about? And two years ago, two and a half years ago, Mark and I went out boots on the ground. We went to all these different sites on Staten Island, and we documented it. We have, we have the block and lot numbers. We know who the owners are. We know the values of these properties. And what we're trying to do now is prioritize the list. We have over 100 sites on this list, which is amazing. And we want to be proactive. We don't want the overdevelopers to come in and do what they did to Graniteville and Mount Marisa. We want to protect these sites before they get destroyed. So we have a list of 100. We're prioritizing the list. We have six sites right now that we, we documented, and we have a lot of information, which you'll see soon. And the one thing I want to emphasize is this Environmental Bond Act will put aside money. Now, Stapleton, which Charlie mentioned before, Stapleton is, is a community that's poor. There's acreage of land on a hillside there called the Serpentine Ridge. There's a few privately owned properties that's heavily wooded. We want to get that protected. It's vital that the children in that neighborhood that suffer from asthma, or high rates of health problems, they don't have access to open green space like they do in other areas. We want to get this land protected. We want to get trails cut. We want to have the kids have access to open green space. There's turkey, deer, 
There's owls, there's all kinds of wildlife in that woodlands. If the developers get in there and start cutting away with these private lots and destroy these trees, what's going to happen is the ecosystem that survives today over the next 10, 20 years will shrink and it won't be viable. So why spend millions of dollars planting trees around the city when we already have trees? Just buy this property with the Environmental Bond Act, put this money into, into good use, protect this site, and the children in that neighborhood, environmentally just as they would have access to open <coughs> green space. And now Mark will describe a little bit more about the sites that we've located. Uh, sure. Well, in addition to that, in terms of the Serpentine Commons and other properties along the Serpentine Ridge, they're very steep. So there's going to be a great deal of a flooding if the trees are cut down. It's the trees that really hold the, uh, the topsoil and the earth in place. So that could cause a great deal of uh, financial a damage to the folks toward the bottom of that hill. And of course, the upper part of that is down by, uh, up by Howland Street. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Serpentine Commons, uh, picture uh, the intersection of Van Duzer Street with St. Paul's Avenue. And just a few uh, steps to the uh, east of that, you'll find a beautifully marked entrance to the Serpentine Commons. So it's a beautiful walk up there. And uh, it is a tremendously uh, beautiful wooded area. It's even got the views looking out over um, uh, New York Harbor and across the Verrazano Bridge. Uh, in addition to that specific area, there's other parts of the Serpentine Ridge. That's a, l a large landmass that runs for two or three miles on the north part of Staten Island. So to the north of that is a place called Homer Street as you're getting closer to Victory Boulevard. And there's a beautiful 2.62 acre parcel there uh, on the hillside side that should be preserved. So when we were there, we saw hawks and uh, a lot of other beautiful wildlife. Then to the south of it, there's two properties of interest uh, also along the ridge. One is a six acre property owned by the New York City Department of um, Citywide Administrative Services. And uh, so that could go for any one of a number of uses, but really it should be turned over to the parks department or the state or some or other branch of the city and be protected in perpetuity. Then if you go a half mile south of that along the ridge, uh, you'll get to uh, Cedar Cliff uh, Avenue. It's by the intersection of uh, Hillside and Van Duzer. So you just look up that hill and there's a 1.9 acre parcel uh, that uh, needs to be preserved. Now if I could just put in for a second, the area you're talking about for our viewers is an area that's right next to Wagner College and St. John's. Yep. It's that, what is it called, Emerson Hill, uh, Toad Hill. Uh, no, not Toad Hill, um, uh, 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 Grimes Hill. Grimes Hill. I get all yeah. these hills mixed up, and I live yeah. right there. If you go back to the map, you'll be able to see. Right. right. But exactly that, what that is. is the beautiful place. I think everybody who comes into Staten Island from the Verrazano Bridge or right. leaving it's, passes yeah. through the valley between those hills, view, and they can see right. that beautiful, beautiful area of forest. And that can be gone. Well, the, view, the views mm -hmm. from Serpentine Nature Preserve which is 11 acres off of Van Duzer Street between Howard Avenue and Van Duzer. That was going to be, you can see it on the map here that's being shown on the screen. It's the green area to the right of the lake. That strip of green is what we're trying to get protected. That was going to be buildings years ago, back in the 1970s, but the Trust for Public Land came in, and the Trust for Public Land provided the money to preserve 11 acres. But there's another 10 to 12 acres that's that's vulnerable, that could be built on. So we want to we want to protect the entire greenery that's there now. Right. Well, Especially I just because the community to, is poor. Right. They I, need it. I agree with you. I just wanted to try and get the viewer to visualize what place that is. Because once we start, start talking streets, it can be very difficult to visualize that. Some of us just live in a little area of Staten Island, don't know the rest okay. of those areas. So I didn't mean to right. interrupt you too much well, there. To move on to the next properties, the next is a Tennyson Drive, that's what we call it. It's adjacent to the Seaside Wildlife Nature Park. Uh, that's it on the screen. And it's a beautiful four acre parcel. It's basically um, wetlands buffer, if it's not actually wetlands. It should really be preserved and potentially incorporated into Seaside Wildlife Nature Park. And that's by Great <coughs> Hills Yacht Club, right? Fairly close, yeah. Yes. Uh, next is um, uh, the Arden Heights Woods. And uh, that would be three different parcels totaling about 30 acres. 
So we all know Arden Heights Woods now, but not all of it is protected. So you see to the eastern portion of Arden Heights Woods, uh, you've got three parcels totaling 30 acres that should be incorporated. Uh, Charlie and Jack and I walked it a while back, full of wetlands and huge and mature trees and quite beautiful. And which area, this would be south uh, of Staten Island, south Staten Island. Would you call it that? Or? Um, head, heading in that direction. It would be off of Woodrow Road. Yeah. And um, Middle Staten Island? Or? Uh, yeah, it's located north, by, right by yes. Auden Avenue. Yeah. Right off of Auden Avenue, okay. Wood, Woodrow Road is just down from there. The, the, what makes that a perfect fit to be preserved is you have Auden, Auden Woods, which is located, it's a city-owned park. And you have DEC property that protects some of the sites there. So this, this unprotected site could be easily purchased by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Mm -hmm. it, it's adjoining property, which makes it an easier way of doing it. So it's privately owned now, but the Department of Environmental Conservation could come in and purchase that. So that's what Mark and I are doing. We're notifying these agencies. Like we are with Serpentine, we had have, we have the DEC down there. We, we contacted the Trust for Public Land. We're going to try to get that 6.1 acres turned over forever wild mm -hmm. with the helps of uh, city And that's council. the process with each of these yes. properties that you're talking about, or parcels that yeah. you're talking yes. about. Yes. Can you I'm going to uh, discuss briefly the next three okay. of our priorities. Uh, next is Outer Bridge Ponds. Sometimes it's referred to as the Page Avenue wetlands or, or woodlands, but they're very close to the Outer Bridge Crossing. There's three adjacent parcels there that total 22 acres. Uh, some beautiful wetlands. That's one slide of it right there. And uh, Wow, that looks yeah, good. So it's a beautiful piece of woodland mm -hmm. that needs to be protected. And you'll see an additional picture there that we took. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, how, do you, how are you not going to save that? But there's tremendous development pressures there. Uh, the next uh, slide we can go to is for the Clay Pit Road to Bloomingdale Park Connector. So it's seven adjacent parcels. Yeah. And... Uh, they are full of woodlands and wetlands, including a spring and a very, very deep uh, creek that runs very strong at certain times of the year. And the last would be an expansion of uh, Clay Pit Ponds State Park. There's a number of two, three, five, six acre parcels adjacent that should be incorporated by the state into that park. And uh, so, you know, we went from originally 100 parcels to be preserved to 20. Now these are our top six. So and Charlie. I have to sort of cut you there because we're running out of time. Um, and this is an ongoing report we hope to get on uh, cable TV here more often to explain and follow up what you guys are doing, or what we guys are doing, because I'm also part of that too. Uh, and uh, just like the Bond Act, we want to follow that up. Uh, so you in the audience who are listening to this, we want you, Kathleen, <coughs> myself, Jack, Mark, and the other people who are behind the scenes uh, and giving us the information here. We want to hear from you what you think are the environmental concerns of Staten Island. From the beaches that we love and we go kayaking on and swimming on and just walking on, all the way through into the Clove Lakes and, uh, and into the Blue Heron Park and into the Serpentine and into the Conference House areas. There's so many areas that we need to talk about. And we're running out of time, so we need you to contact us. We want you and to hear from you what you think are the important aspects of Staten Island, the environmental community of Staten Island. How can we better develop that and stop it from overdevelopment, keep it the way it is, preserve it, and do better with it? And for that, I'd like to thank the people who came here to talk. And I'm sorry I had to cut you off. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk more about some of the uh, wonderful nature uh, hiking uh, and other things to enjoy on Staten Island. That's Kathleen Harris, reporter, Jack Bolenbach, and Mark Latour, more reporters from the Protectors of Pine Oak Woods. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.